Hi, and welcome to the first video lecture for this mathematics course. In this lecture, we'll be covering chapters one and two of the textbook on preliminaries and algebra review, so really the most basic of the, of the building blocks that we're going to deal with in this course. Um, as I said before in the introduction, we're going to start at the very beginning of things, looking at numbers. So this particular module in the course is going to focus on numbers, the idea of numbers. We will then generalize that next module to sets and so on from there. Let's start with numbers. Why are numbers important? Well, one way, one reason you know already, right? you've been knowing it, you've known it since you were a young kid, for counting, right? One, two, three, four, and so on, right? The counting numbers, the numbers you use to count how many things you have in your hand, in the world, in the room, whatever. Right. Turns out we can represent these counting numbers in a pretty straightforward way. Let's add zero first of all, and whether or not you add zero is not that important. We can add zero and call them the counting numbers or the natural numbers. And we can give them a representation on paper like this. So it's like an N with a double line over there. And this is actually a set, and we'll talk about that more in the next module. Um, but this is a set of numbers from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and on forever. They have certain properties. One property is they're countable. Countability is actually a formal mathematical term, but intuitively it just means you can count it. Right. And I should stop here to say something about these courses. Um, we are going to focus entirely on the intuition behind math. It does not mean we will be accurate in our description of mathematics, but we're not going to provide all the, the nitty-gritty details of math for the reasons we talked about in the introduction to this course. There are plenty of mathematics out there that do this. Um, if you are interested in any particular topic after going through this course, you can learn more about it quite easily by perusing the math courses in a university, by buying a math textbook, whatever, or looking online for other sources to get about math. We are going to focus on the intuition behind the, behind the math. So for instance, when we talk about sets, we're going to present sets as a whole, um, the intuition behind sets, some of the notation, the ideas behind sets. But we will not spend time providing axiomatic definitions of sets with all the appropriate counterexamples and special cases and so on. We're going to give you the main point of sets and the utility in political science. Now, back to numbers. Um, so counting numbers. Right, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. That's a set of natural numbers, and they are countable and also unbounded. They have no end, no boundary. There's no set number that sort of walls them in. Right? No matter how big a number you get to, there's always that number plus 1. They're infinite, unbounded. These are properties of the natural numbers. Um, and they, they have an obvious utility that they count. Right? If you want to count the number of people in the country, use the natural numbers. If you want to count the number of war deaths, which comes up a lot in international relations, use the natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Right. They're sufficient for all these purposes and used pretty widely, but they're not complete in the sense that they allow you to do anything you want to do with numbers. So what else might you want to do? Well, you might want to add and subtract numbers. These are operators, addition and subtraction. We'll talk more about them in a few, a couple modules from now. But you're all familiar with addition and subtraction, right? If you add one and one, you get two. It's probably the first piece of arithmetic that you ever did. Well, you can add all these numbers together just fine, and the numbers you, you add stay as natural numbers, right? Three plus 17 is 20. That's also a normal natural number. And it can subtract somewhat, too. If you subtract a smaller number from a, from a bigger number, you stay with the natural numbers. So 17 minus 2 is 15. Again, a natural number. But what if you perhaps wanted to subtract 3 from 2? Right? You had two oranges, you take away 3. What happens there? Well, intuitively, you might say, well, you kind of owe an orange now, right? If you had two oranges and someone else wants 3 from you, you can only give them 2 right now, and you owe them an additional orange. How do you represent owing, right? Well, it's a debt. 
it's a negative value. So if you're doing some kind of accounting, you'd have a negative value in your list, right? If your GDP is actually negative, you're borrowing, right, money instead of producing money, instead of producing out, um, actual goods. The negative numbers are represented with a negative sign in front of them. So if this is two, this is negative two. What do you do with that? Well, the main property of interest in the negative numbers is if you add them to positive numbers, you get a smaller positive number. If you add the opposite, the inverse number to the positive number, you get zero. So plus two plus negative two gives you zero. So positive two plus negative zero, negative two, sorry, gives you zero. Um, and the negative numbers are the additive inverse, we say, to the positive numbers. Um, and it turns out if you put the negative numbers together, the positive numbers, all these natural numbers together, you get a set that is closed under addition and subtraction, which means you can add and subtract anything you want in, the, in that set, and it stays within the set. So it's complete in that sense. So we could represent all sorts of things, right? So if you had, for instance, immigration flows, a positive flow might mean people are coming into your country more than they're leaving, whereas a negative net flow might mean people are leaving your country more than they're coming in. Right? This allows you to represent all sorts of stuff like that. And it's such an important set that we give it a name. We call them the integers. And they represent them with a, with a phrase like that. That's the integer. I'll write that down. That's a fairly important word. Again, this is all in the book. So, um, Integers. The integers is another set consists of comprising all numbers from negative infinity, right, so all the way as far back as you can get, to positive infinity, so both ends have no end. Um, you can put it on a number line like this. Here's 0, here's 1, here's 2, here's negative 1, here's negative 2, on forever in both directions. That's what the arrows mean. And these are the integers. And they cover a lot of what you'd want to do with you know, whole numbers, with numbers that are not split apart. Right? And a single individual is a whole object. But you might ask, what should you do? Um, is this enough? Right? Is this enough? What if you wanted to do other things to it? Now, it turns out you can also multiply numbers together, another operation, and stay within this set. But you can't divide numbers and stay within this set. Right, so 3 times 5 is 15, but what's 5 divided by 3? Right. You can say, oh, it's 1.6. Oh, sorry, not 1.6. 1 1.67, but is that sufficient? Um, that's not in the set, right? 1.67 is not in the set. Decimals are not in the set. To incorporate that, we have to add a conceptual thing to the set. What we do is we add what's called a ratio. A ratio is the division of two numbers is the ratio of x to y, where x is one number and y is the other number. So for instance, the ratio of 3 to 5. This tells you to divide 3 by 5, but in general it's the ratio of two numbers 3 and 5. If we add all the numbers that can be represented by a ratio like this to our set of integers, we get a set called the rational numbers. And they're rational not because they are in some way good thinkers or optimize their behavior appropriately, but because they can, represented, can be represented by a ratio, the rational numbers. Okay. And this covers most of the numbers we want to deal with, but not all. For instance, there are certain numbers that can't be represented by a ratio of two integers. Um, for instance, the circumference of the circle to the diameter of the circle, that ratio, cannot be represented by a ratio of integers. That number you've seen before, it's known as pi, the ratio of the circumference of a circle to the diameter of a circle. And pi is a transcendental number that cannot be represented by ratio of two integers. It is also a really important number because of that property it has. There are other numbers also of importance. E is another transcendental number. It's associated with logarithms. 
and we'll get to some of those as we go on in the course, when we add these numbers to the rational numbers, we get a larger set still, and this set is known as the real numbers. The integers and the real numbers are the most important sets you're going to deal with in political science because pretty much everything we measure in political science can be represented by one of those two kinds of number. Right? We said migrate, immigration, war deaths, these are all things that can be represented by integers, number of children in a household. Right? Real numbers have a wider scope. So a GDP typically is represented by a real number because you can have fractional parts of a dollar or the euro, um, and, and so on. Right? Why do we care about this? We care about this for measurement, which we'll get to in a different lecture, a different module. Um, but one last thing in this module, all this so far is in one dimension. I drew a number line over here to represent integers. The real numbers can be shown by the same number line, just instead of being forced to stay, stay on the number integers, you can be at anywhere at all in the number line you want. The real numbers are dense in this line, it goes on forever in all directions, and covers the entire line. What if, however, um, you wanted to have more than one thing effectively be measured? What if you went to the store and wanted to buy apples and oranges? Well, you can count the number of apples, and you could, in theory, add it to the number of oranges, but maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you want to keep them separate. To do that, you use multidimensional numbers. Right? And again, that might seem complicated. You know, multidimension seems kind of scary, but really, you've do, you do it all the time. If you have a grocery list, right, and you go down, there's seven things in the list, you're keeping track of how much of seven things, of each of the seven things you want to buy. That's a multidimensional number. There's lots of ways to represent that. Um, if I want one of apple and one orange, I can write one comma one. I will talk more about how to actually represent that when we deal with sets more generally. But that's a multidimensional number. It has two dimensions. If we want three things, we could do one, two, seven. That'll be three things. And so on. Um, these are multidimensional numbers. We can represent them in the same notation in several ways. Um, the most common is that this is one dimension, that's two dimensions, and this is the common three-dimensional world we live in now. Um, that covers most of the numbers that we're going to deal with in the class, other than sometimes you want to only look at positive numbers. For instance, you can't have negative people if you're looking at, say, um, births. <laughs> so you might want to say only positive numbers. The plus means only positive numbers. And that's really it. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the first of many modules to come of numbers. And um, next time, we will be looking at sets more generally. Um, I should say, before um, ending, these are not the only possible sets of numbers in the world. These are the only ones we're going to deal with in this course. There are other ones of importance in mathematics in general. For instance, drop here. This is the complex numbers. The complex numbers have imaginary parts. Um, they have a lot of importance in various physical processes, but they don't come up almost ever in political science. We're not going to cover them at all. Uh, that's an aside so that you know this is not the be all end of all numbers, but these are the ones we're going to deal with in this class. Thank you.